All right, cool. Uh, well, hello, Paul. Thank you so much for joining us. And um, let's get started. So I'd like to start off with a quick introduction of yourself and if you can give a little bit of background of your career and your research. Yeah, sure. I'm uh, Paul Zhang, graduated from MIT with a PhD in computer science uh, recently. Um, how I got there was sort of through just interest in computer science for building video games initially. Uh, started in around, around high school, actually, uh, playing with this thing called Game Maker. I don't know if that's still like a go-to. I'm sure there are nicer tools now, but uh, Game Maker was very friendly, easy to use, sort of uh, got me interested in uh, programming uh, as well as game design. And then, uh, well, that led me here. <laughs> So it all started from from just wanting to to make games. Yeah, uh, started from like uh, playing Maple Story uh, in high school or RuneScape back then was pretty oh, popular. I think it's still, oh, it surprises me, but there's still an audience for that. <laughs> um, some really old MMOs, uh, but it would be like you know, growing up in a, a strict household. Uh, you don't get that much game time. So games became a, a precious resource, like the most valuable resource, time available to play any sorts of games. And so uh, I guess that's what wired some of my early um, reward systems in my brain, oh, okay. uh, which just ended up driving me towards, you know, wanting to develop or build my own games, uh, which would allow it to become part of my job, which would allow me to play games nonstop. That was the, the goal of the time. Not exactly how it panned out, but like not too far either. So then that's my next question. Like where, where are you at right now? Like where does, how did, how did your love for games kind of evolve into what your like main goal is right now? Yeah, right now I'm working uh, at a startup doing geometry and AI. Um, can't talk too much about that because uh, we're we're sort of trying to, uh, well, trying to plan the the release of information for when things are ready. Um, but broadly speaking, I did my PhD in the geometric data processing lab. And so got a pretty strong background in geometry processing. Um, so basically the tools you would need uh, to like sculpt, model, rig, uh, animate um, a mesh, which is what you would need for uh, games or movies. Um, and I worked in a much more specific sub-region of that whole pipeline. Um, mm -hmm. Let's say the graphics and geometry pipelines are like massive umbrellas with a lot of subtopics and a phd is a lot more focused than that um but you get also get a lot of breadth just from being in the like neighborhood of these topics you absorb a, a lot of information even just from friends and colleagues and like other people's presentations during conferences that makes sense and so does your specific skill set also apply to, so you mentioned that applies to um, game graphics. Um, does that also apply to things like CAD design or 3D modeling? Yeah, uh, less so on the rendering side, because let's say maybe, like there are a lot of different ways you can cut the, <laughs> cut the cake um, or, or split graphics into sections, but one might be building the geometry and then rendering the geometry and they're both part of graphics um for like cad stuff I would consider that more towards the end of building the geometry and the renders oh. don't need to look you know the most beautiful or complex they just have to be sufficient for you to understand what you're looking at um is definitely relevant we work with a lot of uh cad geometries cad data sets um, specifically, the, the problem I spent a lot of time on was meshing. Uh, so that's like taking one of these CAD geometries, and now let's say you want to do an elastic deformation sim on top of it. 
So like maybe, I don't know, let's just hypothetically say that you've got a mechanical part from CAD and it's going into this movie and it needs to like bend realistically or crumple realistically. Mm -hmm. um, you would need to do a simulation for that. Uh, and to do the simulation, you have to build a mesh of that object. This is where you take like really big planar sheets from the CAD model, you di dissect it into a bunch of little triangles uh, where it's easier to then do the simulation. Uh, a lot of open questions there are on like, what's the best way to mathematically formulate deformation uh, or elastic bending energies, uh, potential energies. Uh, like once you've got your potential energies, the rest of the system kind of drives itself, right? Because you have from, I think, I think in high school physics, you learn that uh, like F equals KX or like force is equal to um, spring potential times X. Yeah. Um, and that is derived as a gradient of the spring potential energy, which is one half KX squared. Uh, once you have that potential energy, the rest of the system just evolves according to the gradient of the energy. Uh, so you could say dx dt, the, the state of the spring, its change in time is exactly equal to the gradient of the potential energy. And so uh, in a lot of these simulation uh, situations, once you've defined the potential energy, the rest is just kind of plug and play. Uh, that is brushing over the entire field of uh, different time integration schemes, but we'll, we'll just pretend that's like one easy little thing that doesn't need expanding. And uh, how would you define time integration schemes just like on a general sense? Yeah, well, if you've ever written like um, like a simple gravity, a ball falling under gravity simulation, uh, you get got your point and its state is just the height. And then there's a potential energy, which is, I don't know, MGH, was that what it is? Yeah. Yeah, you differentiate that. Uh, sorry, H is X is the state, MGX. Um, you take the derivative and it just tells you that the force is constant G, MG, MG downwards. Uh, and then you get your acceleration as force over mass. Uh, and then you say, okay, well, my acceleration is this, but my current velocity is zero uh, and my state is X zero. How do I propagate the acceleration towards my state? Uh, well, you say acceleration doesn't affect my state. Acceleration affects the first time derivative of my state. It affects my velocity. Yeah. And then the velocity affects my state. So there's these like right. two pieces. So you say, okay, my acceleration is G. That means my velocity changes as a function of time with V of T plus one is equal to V at current time plus G times Delta T. Yeah, yeah. Or a little bit of time integration. Uh, and that's one step of just the first effect. And then the next step is to say, okay, well now I've got a little bit of velocity and that little bit of velocity affects uh, my state. Again, according to uh, a little bit of a time step. So you say uh, my current state X is now equal to X naught, like X at time zero plus yeah. uh, velocity times T. This is a forward integration uh, scheme where you just add on the contribution from the next step. Oh, I see. Okay. And so that's what that's what you're doing when you're simulating like the crumple of a of a structure or something. Yeah, pretty much. Let's say in large part, um, unless you've got okay, things <clears throat> get like a whole lot more complicated once you have to worry about collisions because if you think about like movies when the car like it doesn't just crumple when you know the Hulk flings it across the scene. It has to crumple against a thing. And that thing is usually a wall or another car. Um, but in order to handle those collisions, it's a, it's a whole hairy mess. Because now when you do the time integration, you say, okay, Hulk applies acceleration to car in that direction. Car is moving in this direction. 
Um, and it's fine, it's happy to move at steady state velocity, uh, ignoring air resistance until it hits the wall. Uh, but your time step, let's say your time step is like 0.1, and you are a distance 0. 0.00001 from the wall, and uh, what else? Yeah, oh, and your velocity is one. Uh, I'm not assigning units. You can make up units, yeah. let's just say meters per second. Um, yeah, SI units. Um, in the one next forward Euler time step, you are going to go through the wall. Like your state, oh. your state of the car is going to immediately be behind the wall yeah. now, uh, and that's a problem, right? So now there are all these clever methods of saying, okay, what is the smallest, actually, what is the largest time step I'm allowed to take where I can guarantee no collisions have entered the system, uh, and mm -hmm. that's like a really hard problem. It's hard for like two objects. Um, but like a car is not two objects. A car is like a billion triangles because all of these are meshes and the wall itself also needs to crumble. The wall itself is another billion triangles. So you take mm -hmm. a billion triangles, you collide it with another billion triangles and like which pair of triangles are going to collide in the next one time step. This one time step, this is like we want to render at like 60 frames a second. So it's like 1 60th of a second. How many of these triangles are going to collide? That's very expensive computation. You right, kind of just right. have to iterate through all of them and say, okay, for each one of these triangles and each one of these triangles in this time step on their trajectories, would they collide? Uh, yes or no? Um, and that would give you an answer to if they would collide or not that doesn't even answer for you what you do once you know there will be a collision. Right, uh, yeah. which is- All a, the triangles move and everything like that. Mm -hmm. How do you update the, uh, the forces on the initial car so that you'd no longer go through the wall? Uh, maybe the wall also reacts. It gets a, like, it's like Newton says, every force equal and opposite. So if the car crumples, the wall also has to crumple. Uh, how does it do that? How do they distribute? Like, who crumples more? That's all happening behind the scenes every time, like, big object gets smashed on screen <laughs> in a right. movie. So, um, so then I guess that kind of makes sense that your skills would also be applicable to CGI and like the entertainment, the like movie industry, right? Yeah. What I found maybe surprising was like so much of computer graphics is applicable to so much of everything else. Um, of course, CGI is like the main, that's just the angle I, I sort of came at it all with. I entered grad school wanting to do uh, simulations of complicated physics for the purpose of displaying them in movies uh, oh, for okay. things like situations that would be really difficult to uh, like film in real life uh, otherwise. Um, and a lot of the techniques used there, uh, like, okay, one thing, uh, let's take ray tracing, for example, that's like a very classical technique in computer graphics. Uh, yeah. It's how you render uh, a scene. It's how you go from a bunch of like virtual objects in a virtual space that you can't look at to an actual image on your screen that you can now parse. Um, ray tracing is essentially throw a bunch of particles into the scene. Uh, the particles largely do not interact uh, with each other, but they do interact with the scene. Um, turns out this type of physics is also super relevant to just radiation transport. Uh, like, shit, if if a bomb went off and like a bunch of particles of radiation get shot off, how does it disperse in a city? Uh, right. Same process. Uh, maybe the equations are slightly different and the magnitude of the problem is a little different and the severity of mm -hmm. uh, the problem is very different. But like fundamentally, all of these people talk about time integration schemes, spatial discretization, how do you represent the geometry? How do you represent your deformations? Uh, 
how do you evolve the scene in time? I see. So when you're working with meshes, why is um why is the the triangle the most the used shape when you're just when you're trying to define a mesh? It's a very popular choice. Okay, so that this is a really hard question because um, there are two two sort of lines of thought. There's like two groups of people. Let's say one of them really likes triangles and the other group really likes quadrilaterals. Mm -hmm. uh, turns out for artists, for like UV unwrapping purposes uh, or texturing purposes, uh, a quad mesh is way nicer to work with. Also for uh, like rigging and animation purposes, uh, a quad mesh is usually preferred, uh, where each of these little elements is now like a slightly flexible rectangle um, or parallelogram, anything with four points, four edges. Right. Um, triangles are just easier uh, because there's very little structure to them, uh, meaning when you look at a triangle mesh, it's mostly like soup. If I pointed towards one vertex of the triangle mesh and asked you, uh, what's the like number of edges attached to that? Uh, is it going to be six on average? Um, actually, the answer is probably yes. But what's the distribution of the number of edges attached to that vertex? Uh, it's going to be something ranging from like three to 20 ish and the histogram of that plot would be really kind of arbitrary looking oh, okay um so that's what i mean by unstructured uh quads quad meshes are usually built to be very structured so the reason you would use a quad mesh is because locally on any piece of the surface it would look like a cartesian grid and if it looks like a cartesian grid then you can unfold it into a flat uh plane and then you can draw on it so you so it's easier to draw your textures on it if it's a quad mesh mm. um, it's also easier to do certain modifications to the mesh like let's say you're modeling the arm of like a character and then of course if you're modeling a cylinder you want the quads to align in this direction uh, because then if you wanted to make the arm longer like you just want a character with slightly longer arms uh, you would just take all of the edges that cut through like this plane and extend them a little, and it would be right. a very easy operation. For oh, triangle see. meshes, mm -hmm. it's so unstructured that an operation like that would be much harder. You would have to say, okay, I'm going to put the cut here. I'm going to, I don't know, maybe stretch out all of those edges this way, but now the triangulation is going to have a bunch of thin, skinny triangles, and those are typically bad. Uh, they're, they're known as sliver triangles. They don't allow for many modes of deformation. Um, you know, there are technical reasons not to like them, and there are subjective reasons not to like them. Uh, but basically, they're bad. Um, and so then it becomes a whole other secondary problem to take those sliver triangles and turn them back into nice uniform triangles that one would be able to do a, a simulation or a deformation on. I see. And is there ever a, a benefit to combining triangles and quadrilaterals, or does that just make everything like way more complex? Like to I have how it makes things more complex, but yeah. they are used. Um, oh, okay. They're they're called um, quad dominant meshes. Uh, so usually, like artists prefer quadrilaterals. Um, if you could have the ideal quadrilateral mesh, you would take that every day over triangle meshes. The problem is quad meshes are really hard to build um, compared to triangle meshes. And so what people have settled on, or some set of people have settled on, is uh, you can quad mesh the majority of the surface. You could greedily just pave quads on a surface, uh, cover maybe 90% of it, and then just fill the rest with triangles. Uh, and the triangles will account for like a much smaller percentage of it. Um, it really, 
like the effect of doing this really depends on what you're trying to use the mesh for. So if you're trying to use the mesh to simulate uh, some kind of deformation, uh, and there might be, let's say, like a singularity uh, or like a really sharp point of pressure, um, mm -hmm. you might want that to lie uh, exactly on a vertex of the quad mesh. Because uh, if you if you applied the pressure onto a face a face of any mesh really it would be much harder to discretize. Um, discretize. Uh, it would be harder to convert that force um, from like a real world force into something that operates in the virtual setting. So I see, yeah, I didn't really talk about this, but like when we talk about force, we imagine it to be a continuous thing like it exists in R uh, and it exists over the entire domain. Um, so like if I take this hand and hit this hand, it's like affecting this whole continuous region. When you're on a triangle mesh, uh, applying force no longer means applying the force on this whole region. It Its effect only shows up in how it uh, moves the vertices of that mesh. Uh, and right. so the number of vertices, that's finite. That's only like, I don't know, a uh, 100 or a 1,000 vertices that would get de deformed by this like arbitrary motion. Um, so that's what I mean by discretization of the force. Whereas, let's see if I understand, if I understand this correctly, whereas if you were to apply a force to a face, it would be harder to define where exactly on the face you are applying the force? Is that why you would prefer? For right. The force it would be first? like. It would be like, if you had, um, you know, the window wire mesh things that prevent bugs from getting in. Yeah. Let's enlarge that like, ten x. So these like, quads have massive holes in them. Mm -hmm. um, if like these flies are point sources of force, uh, and they happen to land right on the crossing of two of these grids, then of course it will be stopped. And so the mesh will actually reflect the force of the fly. But if the fly just like goes through the, the face, like it will have no idea that there was a barrier there even. It'll just go right through. Oh, okay. That makes sense. I see. And <clears throat> Cool. So I want to talk a little bit more about your different experiences of research. Um, so I've seen that you worked um, for a little bit at uh, Walt Disney. What was the type of work that you were doing over there? Um, it was actually on a pretty similar topic to what we were just discussing. It was on collision detection. Um, so we were working on a higher order collision detection uh, method. Uh, basically, when we talk about triangles, we mostly think they are like flat planar objects, like mm -hmm. whatever three points defines a plane. Triangle always in a plane. Uh, but that's not necessarily true. Um, there are these things called Bezier triangles, which are curved. Mm -hmm. Topologically, they are still triangles because there are three vertices connected to three edges connected to one face. So it's still a triangle, uh, but the edges can be curved, the face can be curved, uh, and exactly how curved they are, it's controlled by a quadratic polynomial, uh, a two variable, um, two output, sorry, three output quadratic polynomial. Um, and so if you think like, okay, how hard is it to detect intersection between two triangles, uh, I bet you could do it. Like, give you paper, a pen, and like some time. You could probably derive uh, the expressions uh, mathematically for when two triangles intersect. Um, I doubt you would be able to do that for quadratic triangles. Um, not sure who could, actually. Um, so we, we rely on computational tools to obtain those answers. Uh, we formulate an optimization problem that says, okay, find me a point on this triangle 
and a second point on this triangle uh, so that in their embedding uh, into R3, in their like world space locations, they right. are actually on the exact same spot. Right. That's an optimization problem. Uh, and there are some constraints like this point cannot leave the boundary of the triangle. Uh, and so if the optimization problem then says, oh, we found a state uh, for these two points where the objective function is zero, uh, that means the distance between these two points is zero, then we have found an intersection. Um, that is just a lot easier to do on planar triangles than it is to do on quadrilateral quadratic triangles, and it's even harder to do for cubic triangles. Uh, each time you increase the order of the polynomial, the shape of the triangle becomes more complicated. Mm, I see. Uh, and I'm saying this for like triangles, but of course it also extends to quadrilaterals. Um, and that's about as far as it extends. I don't think anyone for the most part cares about pentagonal meshing uh sorry no that's not entirely true there are these um voronoi cell meshers uh there's this algorithm called vorocrust uh it's essentially says okay what if we built polyhedral meshes uh instead of tetrahedral or cube meshes um and then the surface mesh would just be polygons it would be pentagons hexagons uh arbitrary like cells, Voronoi cells. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, there, there are people who, there are people who work on almost any uh, geometry you could think of, uh, and they all have their own pros and cons. Say the ones who have won largely are triangles and maybe quads. Uh, quads largely because of historical and um, user preference reasons. Right, and as as you increase the complexity and the orders of magnitude for each of the for those geometries and meshing, um, the more I guess theoretical or inapplicative that sort of geometry gets, right? Uh, the more what it gets. The more um, theoretical or like without the ability to apply it to, let's say, like CGI or yeah, like video yeah. Gets, right? Yeah. Right. Because all of these take like computation to work with, mm -hmm. um, with with little with no exceptions really. Like even intersecting two planar triangles takes computation. Even if you can build a closed form mathematical expression for whether these two triangles intersect or not, you still have to evaluate that expression which means you have to write code that evaluates that expression and then chug it through. Uh, and then you're gonna have to apply it to all billion triangles of your mesh. Um, it, it all comes down to uh, computational speed or computational complexity. Right. So I wanna ask about, um, this, this can apply to any of your experiences so far. What do you think has been one of the most technically challenging problems that you had to uh, solve through by yourself or with the team? And what was your process like um, for, for solving that? Um, but unfortunately say like some of the hardest problems I set out to solve uh, at the beginning of my PhD remain unsolved. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's just because they're like decade old problems that no one solved. And me, one like, you know, brave soul doesn't necessarily solve it either. <laughs> um, but in usually in like that exploration, in diving into the complexities of that problem, you can find sub problems that are solvable. Um, I think to a large extent, that's the privilege of PhD students uh, is that you can change the goalpost. Like if you can't solve problem A because it's too big, but you found this smaller piece of it, that's also worth solving. Uh, 
Uh, so maybe tackle that easier, more restrictive problem instead. Um, let's say I kind of did that. Um, the Well, I've done that on, on different occasions. And maybe one of the examples would be hexahedral singular decomposition. Um, so I was always after hexahedral meshing. Uh, hexahedral meaning cubes, but slightly deformed. So imagine any placement of eight vertices that are connected like a cube. So 12 mm -hmm. edges, six faces. Um, but it's not a perfect cube because none of the lengths of the edges are you know, unit or the same. Uh, the angles don't have to be 90 degrees. Uh, that's see. what makes it a hexahedron and not a cube. Um, and then we wanted to discretize space into these hexahedral cells. Uh, we tried a lot of different methods. Most of them came from frame fielding, um, which is sort of like what you get when you try to build a coordinate frame uh, throughout space on the interior of a mesh, uh, while also bending it to align to the boundary. Uh, and if you can do that, Sometimes you can use those guiding lines uh, to help you build a hexahedral mesh. Um, one of the sub problems of this was the formation of singular nodes or certain knots uh, on the inside of a mesh. Um, these knots are like really complicated objects. They're there's a lot of different descriptions of them, but I guess maybe the easiest approach would be to say uh, any vertex of a quadrilateral mesh that is adjacent to four quads is sort of regular, right? Because that's like normal Cartesian space. Uh, mm -hmm. Every vertex in a Cartesian grid sees four adjacent quads. Um, right. If on the surface of a mesh, you see five quads or three quads, you would be considered singular or irregular. Uh, and these are necessary inside of a, a mesh, inside of any quad mesh, almost any quad mesh. Um, and when you extend that to 3D, these singular points get extruded into 3D space and become singular curves inside the volume. And when multiple singular curves combine, they can turn into knots. Oh, uh, so why, why would the curve why would the curve reside inside of the volume? Um, there's some like proof saying these curves can never terminate. Uh, so they they kind of don't have a choice. They have to enter the volume uh, and then exit out the other side of the volume. Uh, like the only possible termination criteria is to hit the boundary of the object you're meshing. Uh, but like where it's sort of symmetric, wherever you're exiting the boundary, you flip it around, you're also entering from that exact same point. So there's, it's pretty much guaranteed that singular curves will exist on the inside of your mesh. Um, I see. So, so with the, on the normal Cartesian plane, you would have um, the the point, and it's adjacent to four other quadrilaterals. And if you you said that if you change it to three D, then that sort of um, that sort of junction goes like turns into a curve on the inside of the of the the cube figure. So what would be what would so back to two D like that would be so that point would be connecting four different um, shapes, and in the three D, what would that that sort of curve be be connecting or be adjacent to? Not sure that these are really things that could be described verbally. Um, okay. They're like very complicated arrangements of geometries in space. Um, we whiteboard or like 
or I could show you some figures. Would that work for the podcast format? Yeah, that could work. Let me know if you're able to share a screen. I might have to. Mm -hmm. Share content. OK, can you see it? Yeah. Cool. So here is just an illustration of uh, singular curves extending to the interior of a mesh, uh, hexahedral mesh of a sphere. Uh, and on the right is like a way zoomed in look at what one of these singular nodes might be, uh, basically where multiple curves collide or not oh, together. Uh, and so it's like kind of just a knotted, complicated wad of structures um maybe the key, and the goal of this project was uh how do we either understand these knots or take them apart so that we don't have to understand them or start by understanding them and then understand how to take them apart uh, and so that's what this paper was all about um i see so and then this so this this is oh sorry go ahead Essentially, if you have one of these singular knots, you can cut it with a sheet that's like this red surface, uh, and then use it to pull one singular knot apart into two singular knots, which would seem worse, but each of the resulting knots has lower complexity. Oh, okay. Um, I proved sort of via induction that it is possible through a sequence of these cuts to eventually result in no knots at all. Um, here are some like very fairly simple examples of these. Um, it's just like you start on the left with a knotted structure. Um, going down, you insert a sheet. You create space between the sheet, uh, which is essentially the same as cutting and pulling apart. Uh, and then okay. the final result is that these singular curves no longer collide. And if they don't collide, then there is no singular node. Oh, I see. And okay. And how how did you define the the sheet that splits apart the the knots? Like how so is that how is the Largely algorithmically. Um, so there's a way to represent singular nodes as triangulations of a sphere. Uh, and then a sheet is just a loop in that triangulation, uh, a set of edges that creates a closed loop. So uh, when you, what do you specifically mean when you say a, the triangulation of a sphere? Yeah, trying to, okay. Nope, not that figure, this one. So this is a singular node uh, mm -hmm. for a hexahedral mesh. At the very center is the node. And then if you take a sphere, that's this yellow thing, and intersect it with the mesh, uh, you see that every face of the mesh intersects the sphere along a curve on the sphere. Uh, mm -hmm. And it turns out that these curves will partition the sphere into a bunch of little triangles. Oh, I see. I bet. So through this construction, there is a one-to-one -one relationship between sphere triangulations and hexahedral singular nodes. I see. And so this was the problem that you got that you were working on and that you were trying to, and the sub problem, the sub solution that you found out was of splitting the nodes into different or splitting the knots into into several but more but less complex right right 
It's actually to split them until the, there are no singular nodes at all left. Like their the termination criteria is to entirely remove them from existing, uh, which which there are pros and cons for. As if you look at um, this structure, it has singular nodes. Like there's eight of them, but mm -hmm. they're kind of nicely placed. They're symmetric. Um, I think if you handed this to uh, like a volume simulator. It wouldn't be unhappy with you. Um, it'd kind of be acceptable. But then if you untangle each of these singular nodes, uh, it actually creates a lot more deformation throughout the space. But it, it creates a, a lower maximum deformation. So let me explain try to explain why that's important. Uh, when you build a mesh, there is like a quality of the mesh. Uh, and a, the quality for like a triangle mesh is how close is every triangle to equilateral? Uh, for a quad mesh, it's how oh, close is every quad to being a square? Mm -hmm. um, and then for hexahedral meshes, it's how close is every hexahedron to being a cube? Mm -hmm. um, and there's one of these scores for every single element of the mesh. Uh, and so you can actually plot volumetrically the, like, the score across the entire mesh. And what you would find is that the worst scores always happen at the singular nodes. So the, the uh, so scores of, of the quality in terms of yes. like how regular the shapes are. OK. Yes, the, the quality of these mesh elements are hurt by pre the existence of singular nodes. Uh, furthermore, the quality of the mesh usually has direct correlations to the quality of simulations that are run on those meshes. Uh, and so you would really prefer that your mesh be good everywhere, like as right. undistorted as possible. Um, and so what we found is that singular nodes create a lot of distortion. Uh, and so they also create a lot of uh, failure modes for simulations on such meshes. So if you can get rid of the singular nodes, you're removing sort of a theoretical upper uh, lower bound on the distortion, uh, which allows you to lower your distortion score and then improve the simulation quality. That's reaching a little into like uh, extended goals of this work. What we showed was that the distortion of the mesh goes down. Um, so essentially, mm -hmm. so essentially, your your solution of of dividing up the the knots with the with those sheets um, until there's um, no singular nodes that leads the whole. Um, mesh to have a, a lower or sorry a higher quality score and lower distortion mm -hmm. i see yeah. okay interesting and and what is a specific ap application that this solution could um like well, yeah like what is a specific application that this could go into direct like immediately simulation it's for like the, the main reason you build meshes is to then simulate them, um, either under sort of elastic stresses or um, thermal stresses. Uh, you could imagine this sphere represents, I mean, it's very simplified, but like imagine a more complicated volume that represented a mechanical part inside your computer. And you just mm -hmm. wanna know how does the heat dissipate through this part? Uh, well, it propagates um, approximate. It propagates according to the uh, Laplacian equation, uh, which you can compute discreetly on a mesh. By it essentially turns into you add heat to one cell of the mesh, and then that cell distributes some heat to all of its neighbors, and those neighbors distribute heat to all of their neighbors. Uh, but a little less each time. Um, and this is the step you repeat 
to get time integration. And eventually you get oh, I see. Okay. sort of thermal profile of the shape uh, mm -hmm. under a certain thermal actuation. So like, I don't know, you put a really hot object on this part uh, and you want to know how it distributes the heat throughout. That has to happen on a mesh of the object, like a hexahedral mesh, um, which has a certain quality score. And you would ideally want the mesh with the best quality. And so what happens if you're simulating uh, an object that has um, varying, varying material um, how I describe this, like um, the, 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 the material is not constant, like either the the, the, the density changes or the actual um, changes into a different element. How would you, how would you add that sort of component into the simulation? Because obviously now with that information, maybe one face, one, one, yeah, like one cell wouldn't, um, transfer heat as well as another cell or it wouldn't be as as clean of a uh, of a border between like what cell a transfers heat for this fast whereas cell b transfers um heat at a different speed but it wouldn't be a clear if the cells were like right together it wouldn't be a clear like um line and changing the speed right of of thermal what you're getting at is like non-uniform metrics over uh, a space. So like the the metric over a space is usually just like flat Euclidean. You say, um, you know, one meter is one meter everywhere. Uh, that actually doesn't turn out to be true even in real life. But for the most part, it's like an acceptable approximation. Um, but hypothetically, you could say, Oh, a meter here where I am is actually worth half a meter where you are. Uh, and that would be equivalent to saying like the difficulty of an object traveling that distance um, is twice as hard when you're over here relative to when that object is with you. Um, mm -hmm. That object that's tra traveling in this scenario is like a wave of heat. Um, and the way you incorporate oh. that into the mesh is through weighting factors on the edges of the mesh. So it's so, literally changing the size of the geom or the like. Let's say um, if if so if so a transfers heat um, slower than cell b, then cell a would just the only change would be the, the size of cell a. Not is that physical true? size. Uh, because like the object is the shape that it is like you can't right yeah as you could <laughs> okay the way you usually do it is you say each of these edges has a different um, property to it um, a conductivity like a thermal conductivity to it um, yeah. and that's just like usually unit one everywhere but if you wanted to say, oh, actually, the left half of this object has much lower thermal conductivity, uh, you would just assign that property to all of these edges. Uh, and that has an effect on how you build the Laplacian operator. The Laplacian operator is sort of, um, well, lets you compute uh, the next time step of the heat distribution. Um, mm -hmm. And so you would factor that into the Laplacian, which would then factor into the uh, thermal propagation. The geometry itself would not change because like, if you are manufacturing the part, it's not like you would build it in a different shape. Right, uh, yeah. You would keep the shape, it just happens to be multiple materials. Um, and you can do this in a lot of different ways. Um, you can put the metric on the edges of the mesh. You can also put the metric on the cells of the mesh, like one metric oh, okay. for uh, the center of every cube element. Um, I think for 
It also depends on what mesh you're using. So if you were in a triangle mesh uh, and you put a scalar field, like a temperature field, on the vertices of the mesh, then the gradient of that temperature profile lives on the triangle faces. And then if you have to integrate the these gradients relative to the metric, then the metric also has to live in the same space, meaning the metric is also on faces of the mesh and not on vertices or edges. Okay. But there's there's like different formulations that are all in the limit of infinite resolution, meaning as all of these edges go down to zero size, volume mm -hmm. is maintained, uh, the solutions to these PDE converge to the same thing. I see. So with this specific problem, this or this paper, what was um, the, your process for problem solving? How did you come to the conclusion that you were able to split up these nodes into different, into a higher quantity, what, which would bring the complexity down to zero? Like, What was your process for problem solving that? Very long and twisted. <laughs> in my first year in grad school, I asked my advisor to buy me 200 ping pong balls. And on each of the ping pong balls, I would draw like one of these things, the tr sphere triangulations corresponding mm -hmm. to a different singular node. Uh, in drawing a bunch of these different types of nodes, I started to notice patterns like, Oh, actually, these two ping pong balls look almost the same as this other ping pong ball if I just put them close to each other. Is that a coincidence? I don't know, maybe. And then I didn't think about the problem for a year and a half uh, and rediscovered these ping pong balls with these weird drawings on them uh, in our cupboard uh, much later. Uh, are you still there? Yeah, I'm still here. OK. Uh, the video was frozen for a bit. Um, oh. Yeah, so I redis rediscovered these old drawings. And at that point, it sort of clicked that, um, oh, wait, I can combine two of these together. And that would be pretty easy. Um, oh, interesting. Okay. I have no idea how to split them apart. I have no idea what the application of this is. This is like one of those things where you you discover the tool before you know the reason the tool exists. Mm -hmm. um, so like there there was no reason to do this other than mathematical curiosity or just geometric curiosity. Um, at about the same time then, uh, my advisor was running a thing called SGI, Summer Geometry Initiative uh, at MIT, um, where we get a bunch of like, kids who are com considering academia or higher level education and just give them some experience in geometry. And so I pitched exploring this idea uh, with a couple students as a project with no real like direction or like necessarily a goal or even the idea of submitting any of it as a paper. Mm -hmm. um, then just sort of in the discussions with those students um, who are also the co-authors of the paper. Um, okay. uh, so in discussion with these three people, um, we ended up finding uh, out that it is possible to decompose any node into smaller pieces. Um, and then it sort of remained to say, well, OK, what can we do with that? Is that enough to remove all singular nodes? Uh, and that part happened in a, in a feverish haze of it's two days from the deadline for this journal or this conference. Uh, mm -hmm. Does a solution actually exist? I've already written 70% of the paper assuming the solution does exist. So there better be one. And I need to find it fast. Yeah. Um, so those were some like fever dream days of uh, just trying out a whole bunch of different graph combinations, 
and eventually arriving at a proof that this could work. That's awesome. So when you're working on these sorts of problems that are very visual and um, um, obviously applied to simulations and obviously, like I said, it's very visual, how do you work out the math in the sense of are you, is most of your work done, like what is it, I guess what I'm asking is what does a typical work session look like for you um, if you're doing one of these research papers or in, in a previous job that you've had? Most of my process is um, heavily reliant on visualization. Like if I can't see what the computer is doing, then I'm blind and that's mm -hmm. like not good for anyone. Um, so usually in like building meshes or like decomposing the singular nodes, what I had was I wrote up like a little script that would essentially visualize, create these drawings of what certain decompositions looked like. Uh, okay. And then I added a little bit of an interface. It was half half user interface and half hard coded uh, like magic numbers within a, a program to create these drawings. Um, because it's not usually worth the time of investing in like a huge UI. That's more like a software engineering problem. Um, but at the same time, you need a minimal level of visualization to achieve anything or to understand anything. So I wrote some like pretty minimal scripts to just, well, one, display a mesh like the ones you're seeing to color faces in uh, according to a cut surface color singular curves in, color singular nodes in, make sure they're all different colors so that you can actually separate them from each other. Um, right. And at the time, I wasn't like thinking very much about colorblind people, but it strikes me now that these, these colors may not be the best for that. Uh, too late, <laughs> it is, it's out there, but um, things to remember for next time. Um, but yeah, I, I think my process usually goes, is there something interesting here? Something that like tickles my curiosity that makes me want to poke at the problem more? Is there, if there isn't, then it's already done, like I'm moving on mm. to the next thing. Um, and then if there is something I'm curious about, then I'll poke at it until I either understand it uh, or give up. And if I can find something to understand, then I can see if everybody else already understood this or not. Because uh, there's always like a possibility that, uh, you know, whatever you're discovering was discovered in uh, another country and is buried in their national archives in their language right. from decades ago. And you'll find it the day before you try to submit. <laughs> and then you'll have wasted all that time. It doesn't usually work out that dramatically, but like I think it's a common story in academia uh, where you work on a topic you think is really interesting and then find that someone else already uh, tried it. Tried it, yeah, that makes sense. So then that kind of leads me to ask, why, why did, what made you want to make the move from academia to working at this startup? Mm. A lot of it was financial concerns. Mm. Um, as a grad student at MIT, I think our pay was about 40. And I was also on a fellowship, so on the higher end of that, uh, mm -hmm. 40K per year. Um, it's actually like the financial situation is super complicated because one could argue that you're actually being paid a whole lot more like I don't know, it's it's 44K what you take home plus tuition of the school. And then you just happen to choose to take that tuition money and give it right back to the school. Uh, mm -hmm. So like, what's your actual salary? A little unclear. I think to most grad students, uh, they consider the, the amount you take home minus uh, the tuition. 
like tuition doesn't count as part of your income. I see. Uh, and there are some like tax reasons for this to essentially like that tuition is untaxed. Uh, you just like, I mean, it doesn't even transfer hands. You never see it. Like it never makes it to your bank account. So there's not like even yeah. a phase at which it would get taxed. Um, MIT has it the entire time. They, you know, they take the money and they hand it to the other hand and they put it back in the pocket. It's yeah. uh, one of those weird financial loop things. Um, hopefully not getting in trouble with like tax lawyers or anything, but all that is to say grad students are not paid a lot. Uh, like it's enough to live off of. It's not enough to really save or like build a retirement off of. Yeah. Um, sure. And so you do that for five or six years. Um, five would be like great. Six years, pretty typical, honestly, to do a PhD in the US. Uh, it's different in Europe, by the way. In Europe, it's like two to three years for a PhD, but oh, wow. you have to enter with a master's already. Whereas in the US, you enter without a master's, or you can enter with a master's, but it's optional. I see. Uh, so very, very different academic systems, actually. Um, but so you're making this like 44K ish. Uh, and honestly, that's on the high end, I'm pretty sure. Because um, I had a fellowship supporting me that bumps up the stipend a bit. Um, it's also MIT, so that also bumps it up a bit. Um, it's also EECS, so like computer science stipends are generally higher than Makes like sense. other, you know, other research fields. Um, all of that combined, and this and the net total is about forty four k. Yeah, I hadn't, I hadn't realized that it was so low, and that that is a very tough financial situation for people doing research. And you have to consider the uh, like what you're missing out on, because if you do your, well, I'm not sure for a mechanical engineer, but if you were to say to do CS at Carnegie Mellon, you'll graduate and you'll hit like 120, 130 k salary like immediate offers. Right. And if you compare that to grad school, well, you're taking quite a cut. Um, mm -hmm. And that 44K is not going to be like, you know, raises every year. Uh, MIT just unionized. So now we can like, you know, as a union fight for whatever raises that match inflation, but not raises raises. It's just to match inflation. <laughs> Yeah. Um, compare that to like Microsoft. Uh, I went to Microsoft out of undergrad, uh, mm -hmm. worked first year at a 103K salary, and uh, in one year it went up to 115K. Oh, wow. It's just, I guess, normal for software. I don't know. Or maybe I did great. <laughs> <laughs> I'll tell myself that. But the the financial situation is like massively different right um, that end okay say you finish your phd uh you've sunk these six years in uh you took a pay cut essentially like a massive pay cut uh but yeah. you learned a whole lot and you were able to do things that no one else was going to pay you anything to do right like if i went to microsoft and i said oh actually why don't you buy me ping pong balls and let me color them in they'd fire me. So like being in grad school is a very unique opportunity uh, for the cost. It's not something you could do normally. Right, um, right. And so that's the, the plus side. Like if there's a problem you really want to investigate and like there's a PI who does that and you want to join their lab, take a pay cut. Like if you can afford it, take a pay cut like work towards something you you find really interesting. Um, and then you get to decide whether you want to continue in academia or not. So mm -hmm. what happens if you continue is the following. Uh, you can be promoted 
massively to a whopping 60K uh, as a postdoc. <laughs> wow. Yes. Uh, stunning. It depends. OK, postdoc salaries vary a lot more on the high end if you have okay. certain special fellowships within a national lab that are very rare to get. Uh, mm -hmm. You could have a salary of like 120K. Um, most postdoc salaries, I think postdoc salaries at MIT, from what I've heard, lie in the 60 to 80K range. Um, both less than an entry level coding job. So, and that's not even accounting for the, the stocks and the perks and the 401K matching. Right. Like, can't, <laughs> can't stress enough how massive of a difference the financial situations are. Yeah, the opportunity cost is huge. Because then after after a postdoc, you would move into potentially being like the professor path, right? <laughs> no, you get to do your second postdoc. Really? Oh my god. It depends on the field, but there are fields where you do one to two postdocs before you get a professor position. It depends on the market. It depends on how many roles have opened up recently, which universities have gotten funding to hire a new professor. Uh, and these are all like kind of up in the air, way out of your control. You just have to see it and, and jump on the opportunity if like you know a university is going to have positions for professorship. Maybe you speed up your PhD and try to line up your graduation with that role opening. I see. Uh, maybe yeah. you skip a, a postdoc phase. Um, but that's also assuming you make like a really stellar PhD. Like, I think I've published a lot of papers in my PhD just numerically. Um, I still wouldn't count mine as like stellar, as like. I don't know. It's it's pretty subjective, but like, if you right. consider your impact on the academic community, it's driven partially by like quality and quantity of your publications. More is better, and better papers are better. Um, but it's also driven by tweets. How much of a Twitter presence do you have? Um, oh, really? Oh, yeah. If you tweet about your papers a lot and you have a, a big following, your numbers will go up. Your like citation count will go up. More people will know your work. Um, a large reason for presenting at conferences is to uh, get the word out that this work now exists. And get your citations up. Mm -hmm. Wow. That's okay. like that's not a game I ever played. I like had a Twitter for about two weeks and then I deleted it because it was I don't know, uninterested in that game. Uh, but if you want an academic career, I almost feel like you have to have a Twitter now. Interesting. I never I've never that, I feel like you're the first person that I've talked to that has mentioned that that sort of game um is super, super crucial. <laughs> Should ask uh Ask professors like on the younger side, the ones whose hiring situations would be closer to yours if you were to pursue academia, mm -hmm. how long they've had Twitter for, how many followers they have, how many times do they retweet papers from their friends who tweeted, how many papers do they find on Twitter, oh, I mean X, um, yeah. every, every conference cycle. It's significant. Yeah. Cool. So I want to end off the inter interview with a couple of miscellaneous questions. Um, the first one I want to ask is, what do you think are some maybe mistakes or things that you ch that you would change in your career now that you have the knowledge that you have? Hmm. And this could be in academia, industry. I think I would have spent more time on foundations if I could have. 
What do you mean by found foundations? Foundational reusable code. For a lot of my projects, the code base is essentially written from scratch again, over and over. Oh, uh, because wow. there is some overlap that like I can copy paste from one into the other, but they were never super unified. And so I've written the same like little bit of code to convert to compute the Laplacian of a mesh like five different times in like two different ways didn't have to be like that. Um, if I had started from the ground up building a like a toolbox that's reusable with very strictly defined input output that I would leverage myself for the rest of the PhD, it would have paid off because you're you're going into like a five to six year time span. It's mm -hmm. worth investing in your early tooling. Uh, that and maybe like learning PyTorch earlier. Uh, a lot of my time was spent differentiating really complicated functions uh, for optimization purposes. Mm -hmm. That's like, that's something people can do automatically now. There's not like too much reason to do it yourself uh, nowadays. That said, back when I started, a lot of packages like tiny ad tiny auto diff didn't exist uh, and so it would have been harder i might have had to rewrite like write my own version of things uh, but if i'd started with the mindset of writing a like easier to use auto differentiable package uh, might have saved a lot of headache over six years right like an example would, of that would be maybe code that you would have written beforehand that you could have applied to this paper that you're showing me about um, pr generating those images, right? Actually, this one <laughs> is an exception because it was a very topological paper. Like the connections between vertices and faces are what changes, but not something differentiable. It's not like you can take the gradient of a edge split operation. It's like you can't differentiate the act of cutting an apple in half. That's not a continuous operation. Right. It's, yeah. it's just one and then it's two. Right. Um, so, so an auto diff investment wouldn't have helped me here. Um, what might have helped me here would be like writing a half face data structure for hexahedral meshes. Uh, there's this very like widely used data structure for triangle meshes called half edge. Uh, and it essentially allows you to, from any one location of a mesh, explore your neighborhood, like get all of the adjacent geometries attached to you, uh, get their adjacent geometries, et cetera. Like you could do a whole graph sweep with it, with this. Mm -hmm. Um, and that largely didn't exist for uh, volumes, at least as far as I know, especially not in a very easy to use format. I think open volume mesh might have been the closest because they, they supported uh, polyhedral meshes. And so these mesh elements are attached to their polygonal faces uh, and their adjacent neighboring elements. Um, if I had started by writing a hexahedral specific version of that tool, uh, would have saved me a lot of debugging effort in generating right. the visualizations for this paper. Mm -hmm. But sense. it's it's a little hard to say when you need to like dive into the investment because writing a project of that magnitude is gonna take like a month or two. Uh, that's a month or two that you would not be, you know, very clearly exploring the frontier of knowledge. Uh, you would just be supporting your own jumping pad. It's right. still unclear to me what the right balance is, but I'm leaning towards like build your foundation better. It'll pay off in the future.
Yeah, and then like the balance of knowing when and how much to invest in the beginning because you don't know how long the project is going to be, right? Right. There was only one project where everything sort of worked so perfectly and smoothly that it was kind of like textbook. What was that project? It was a image triangulations paper. Um, it was a method of taking images as input and converting them into like triangle tiled images. Uh, so kind of like a mosaic -y texture yeah. of it. Uh, and the the like goal is largely artistic. Like it's a okay. Like you might be interested in a mosaic effect. Well, here's an alternative. It's the triangulation effect. Mm. Um, and these filters, there's like a bunch in Photoshop and like any image editing tool. Uh, and this would have just been one more of them. Um, what he did there was start with, this seems like a cool goal. I bet I could implement it. Oh, it's going to take some math. Oh, here's the math. I've derived it. Now I just have to implement it. OK, now I've implemented it. Uh, OK, time to write the paper. And right. I wrote the paper. And it was all just very, like, no hiccups in the road. It just worked right until the very end. Uh, where I found out that someone else did this two years ago. <laughs> oh my god! So yeah, really sucks when that happens. All right. Well, the last question I want to end off with is more of a, a fun one. Um, if you had to have dinner with anybody from human history that are alive, who would who would it be and why? Hmm. I, I guess you could choose two I'm, people. I'm supposed to say like Einstein or Feynman or something because that's what the the tech people are supposed to want. But I mean, it could be anything. It doesn't have okay, to be related Einstein to. Einstein probably speaks German, and I don't know <laughs> German. Or, no, he spoke English too. But I don't know if we'd relate enough. Maybe like an old sci-fi writer. Actually, let me look at the name right so I could. OK, Satoshi Kon. Do you Satoshi know Kon? Yeah. He's a Japanese film director and animator. Um, he did Paprika. That was like one of his more popular uh, anime movies. Mm -hmm. um, also did Tokyo Godfathers, Paranoid Agent. I don't know, a lot of like weird animes relatively, but also animated really beautifully. Mm -hmm. And he has a lot of takes on how the animation industry went and how it should have gone and how it was wrong. Uh, in terms of like artistic style or? In terms cool? of being a sustainable industry that doesn't oh. burn out its artists. Right. Uh, through ridiculously long hours and low pay and uh, essentially some kind of indentured servitude uh, mm -hmm. driven on the dream of being an animator. I would have liked to uh, have a discussion about that with him, <laughs> get some takes. Interesting. That's cool. Awesome. Well, I you? think me, well, um, I don't know. Actually, okay. Assuming assuming that I could communicate with the person, um, I think I would choose Leonardo da Vinci, because, mm. I mean, he was essentially like a polymath, right? Like he had he was like a master of many things, like art, engineering, science, and I think that's kind of, in a sense, what I aspire to be. So, I think getting his perspective on how he can relate how he can relate different disciplines would be super interesting to, to see, especially since like that sort of multidisciplinary mind, I think is was probably realistically harder to come by in his time of in like the 1400s, 1500s, whenever he lived. 
So I think that'll be really interesting to like pick his brain and like see the how unique his perspective was towards different disciplines. Yeah. Yeah. It's definitely a good one. Mm -hmm. For your goal to become a sort of generalist uh, in like all of these arts, um, like how deeply would you want to dive into something like technical stuff? That's a good question. Um, I definitely want to, I'd say the worst version is sp spreading myself so thin over the, co over the course of my life to the point where I don't get deep, I don't get super deep into um, anything, you know? So I definitely want to conduct a lot of research in, when I'm at CMU and go deep into very like specific ideas because I think it's really important um, attaining mastery, like a very, a lot of knowledge about like one specific thing um, kind of like what a research paper is. And then, because once you attain mastery, you kind of have the principles behind attaining mastery and many other things, you know what I mean? Um, so I definitely want to start small, like don't spread myself thin very in the, in the very beginning so that I can dive deep, see what it's like to be a master at something, and then apply that to like build off of a lot of other things, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, I think diving deep into one would be a, a good starting point, as long as you don't get stuck in that one afterwards. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's I I would imagine that it's kind of hard to tell as a researcher when you like when do you stop? You know what I mean? Like when do you stop exploring this problem and move on to something else or or just call it a day, kind of. There's a lot of technical literacy that just is like gate kept by jargon. Because like, mm -hmm. I know I've used a lot of terms just in this interview that are probably not typical. And I'm not really sure to what extent you've like arranged it together in your head to make something coherent and hopefully have done like a decent job at it, but possibly not. Um, but that kind oh, of yeah. jargon, it, yeah, go it's ahead. in like every subfield, and so the barrier to entry is just large for every next field you try to pick up. He's still there. Uh oh. Lou, you back? Can you hear me? Yeah. Okay, perfect. Cool. Sorry about that. There's, there's a huge, uh, there's a ton of rain and there's like a storm going on where I live, so the, my internet's mm -hmm. kind of going in and out. Mm -hmm. So what what made you want to do this podcast or interview series? Yeah. So I essentially, well, basically the premise is just to learn from a lot of people. I feel like. I have realized over the over my time that a huge percentage of people's knowledge is gained through just talking to other people, not like studying a textbook or thinking by yourself. Um, so that's why I started this interview platform. I started it, um, I think, in junior year of high school. And ever since, I've just been um, trying to have a diverse set of people that I've interviewed. Um, obviously, it's been more towards STEM, but um, like I've, inf I've interviewed like a soccer trainer. Um, actually, on Tuesday, I'm interviewing a filmmaker. So I want to definitely like ex expand my range in, um, in topics. I don't know if you've ever seen Joe Rogan, but he interviews like everybody. So I would imagine that he kind of, that sort of, um, like spread of interviewing people definitely mm -hmm. inspired me. Uh, 
Interesting. But, yeah. Yeah, he goes for uh, a large range, but I don't. Let's see which like stem people have he has he had on. He's had, well, top of the head, he's had um, Elon Musk, but that's not like he's not like a very. I guess the conversations aren't usually very stemmy. Technical, or, yeah. Like businessy with, with yeah with they're them. a lot more like abstract and not very applicative to like how you do certain like how you like the explanation of a technical thing you know what i mean i remember he was talking to one of these quantum physicists at caltech that was a uh, like a proponent of the everything is a wave theory of the world mm -hmm. And that would have been like clearly someone who's really well trained in STEM. The conversation right. was incredibly high level. Felt like uh, like a philosophy conversation. Yeah, and I think you said at some point even that like a lot of STEM boils down, a lot of physics ends up boiling down to philosophy. Because mm -hmm. uh, there was, you know, a time in physics when things weren't so concretely understood, right? Like masses of particles weren't defined, or even knowing whether these particles exist wasn't clear. Mm -hmm. And it's just a bunch of like philosophers conjuring up, "What if the world was this way or this way?" Yeah. And eventually, they found out that it was certain ways. That he yeah, said something like. Thing like all physicists should also like study philosophy. Mm -hmm. oh, that was a, a hot take. Yeah, no, I don't. I don't know if you've read um, a brief history of time by Stephen Hawking, um, and I've read a couple of chapters. And it seems obviously it's about. So just to give context, it's a little bit. It's about the how our perspective of the universe evolved over time, and. A lot of it just seems like philo like a philosophy book, um, like people reasoning why it's so illogical that our our planet, the Earth, would be the center of the universe. Like that's more of like a logical conception rather than, um, well, it's a logical conception about our physical reality. You know what I mean? So, um, yeah, like you def I definitely agree with you how like the beginning of physics kind of just becomes or is like philosophy. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, cool. Well, uh, cool. wish you the best in your interviews and CMU and everything else. Definitely, definitely. I will. Um, I'll let you know once I once I post the once I post the interview, and I'll send you a link to the, cool. to the video. Thanks. <laughs> awesome. Well, right. thank you so much, Paul. Thank you. Have a See great you later. See you night. Bye. You too.